Hello and welcome. Um, my name is Daniel Peabody. I'm a director here at Elizabeth Leach Gallery. On behalf of myself, Elizabeth, and the whole gallery team, I want to welcome you and thank you for joining us this evening. Um, I want to just mention that the gallery is celebrating our 40th anniversary this year, uh, and we are excited to have as part of our 40th anniversary program for this year, 2021, um, these exhibitions with Stephen Hayes and Greg Renfro. Um, I want to obviously thank you for joining us, and I want to encourage you to ask questions. Um, if you have questions for either of the artists or, or, to me, or questions about the show, feel free to ask in the comments, and we will address those um, in a little bit. Um, but please go ahead and think about it. If you have questions during the talks, uh, please go ahead and post those, and we will um, address them. Um, we have with us tonight Stephen Hayes. Uh, and Greg Renfro. Uh, their exhibitions are, are on view October 7th through 30th uh, of this year, 2021. Uh, Stephen Hayes's exhibition is titled Replace, and Greg Renfro's exhibition is titled Apprehension of Beauty. Um, and we're going to uh, do this in an order where we talk with Stephen first about his exhibition, and we'll see some images of the installation, and then we'll talk with Greg second. So, um, First off, I just want to thank you both for joining us this evening. Of course, yeah. yeah you're welcome. Um, Stephen Hayes uh, has been work has shown his work at Elizabeth Leach Gallery for 35 years now, and uh, in that time, he has had 21, uh, 22. Sorry, this is his 22nd solo exhibition at Elizabeth Leach Gallery. I looked this up today, and I was really impressed with that. Um, among many other exhibitions around the, the world uh, and around the country. Um, notably, in 2013, he did an exhibition titled Figure Ground at the Hoffman Gallery at Lewis and Clark College here in Portland. And that was a 30-year retrospective that was accompanied by a book. I'm hoping some of you perhaps saw that. Um, his work can be found in a number of uh, prestigious collections, including the Portland Art Museum, the Halley Ford Museum of Art, the Collins Foundation, Microsoft, the Gates Foundation, and the New York Public Library, amongst many others. Um, and he's a, a, been awarded some quite uh, incredible um, accolades, including in 2011, he won the Halley Ford Fellowship for Visual Arts, which is a very prestigious uh, uh, award here in Oregon. And in 2018, won a Guggenheim Fellowship uh, for his work on his series uh, in the hour before. So um, I want to welcome Stephen. Thank you for being with us today and for this beautiful show. Thanks, Daniel. Well, great introduction. I appreciate that. Um, I'm not sure how you want to proceed if you want me to talk about the work like this as you're showing it, or if you want to ask me any uh, leading questions. Well, I mean, I would love to hear anything you want to say, but I also thought maybe we could you could just tell us how this body of work started. Great. So, you know, the last five years I've been working on this uh, body of work in the hour before that you mentioned. And uh, the premise of that work uh, was based on traveling uh, virtually to sites of violence in the, in the country, using Google Earth as, a, as a, a mode of traveling to places where mass shootings happen, to places where, you know, basically unspeakable violence that happened. And making uh, using Google Earth to see the land. I'm a land. I've been painting the land and the, and using the landscape as a as a subject and a metaphor for decades. Um, and I have a, a 40 year practice of plein air painting, going outdoors, schlepping the stuff with me on my back, and going out, you know, into the field and painting. But using Google Earth uh, as a way to see places that I physically really couldn't get to just economically and, you know, whatever, you know, logistically, but also places that had a uh, huge significance in the, what was happening, uh, happening in the country on a social political scale um, allowed me using Google Earth allowed me to go to those places and explore the sort of innocuous imagery that comes out of that um, thing. Google Earth, cameras on the back of a car, just driving and taking pictures. I kind of think of it as drift net fishing with a camera, you know, and they're it's just taking millions and millions and millions of photos. And my job as a painter then was to go, and is still, to go uh, and look at what's in the drift net and look for gems 
and look for things that speak to me and that I can resonate with, not only for their content, the meaning of the imagery that I'm seeing, but also just for their potential as structure, as color, as um, the way to enter making an image. So this body of work, uh, you called it replace, and that's a great way to pronounce that. And I call it replace. And that's a great way to pronounce that. They're not, you know, it's strategically designed to suggest one and the other at the same time. That um, these are about place. Primarily, these are locally accessible uh, places on uh, Selvi Island, which is only 10 miles outside of Portland, a place that I've gone to for decades to set up my plein air practice and paint. And after the experience of the last five years working on In the Hour Before, which is a project that's ongoing, I'm, it's just on a hiatus right now, I needed a break from that. Um, I have been seeing the land at Salvi Island in a very different way than I ever have before. I'm looking at it not just as beauty and nature and the land and color and light and the joyful experience of being outside and painting, both of which I love, <laughs> both of those things I just love. But in our time, we are asked to awaken a little bit or a lot, and to recognize that that land, in fact, was not always available, uh, was not always land that somebody who looks like me had access to, or should, or was living in. Uh, and so these, built into these paintings is kind of a recognition that anytime I make a painting on Sovi Island, for example, close by, I'm seeing a land which has a long history, uh, connected to a populace which has its own history. You know, um, so I'm I'm not illustrating stories. I'm not depicting events, but I'm not unaware that buried underneath all this surface of paint and machination of moving materials around and making kind of beautiful images. And I, and I look for beauty all the time in the work that I make, that there also is built in there this understory. And um, so that's what this body of work is starting to explore, is kind of inculcating one form with the knowledge of an, another reality. And it's not unrelated to the In the Hour Before project that I also have going on here, which is building in, relying on beauty to engage us, to pull us in, and asking us to think <laughs> a little bit past just that. Anyway. One of the things that's interesting to me about this particular body of work, I mean, obviously, you, you've brought up some really big um, uh, intentions for the body of work but one of the things that i think is uh maybe unique i mean one people your audience will recognize these paintings uh in the sense that they're um they'll recognize the imagery as that of a you know agrarian um agricultural space out in the outskirts of portland you've painted Sovia mm -hmm. island for years as you mentioned but um rather uh, than kind of going there and painting plein air you are um you are visiting using Google Earth technology like you did in the hour before. And um, I'm kind of wondering, um, you know, what's your process a little bit? Like, uh, are you, are those source images? Or is it just a way to trigger your memory of the place? Um, you know, because these aren't plein air paintings, they're studio paintings, um, but they have, you know, you have a lot of history with that painting in that place. Um, I'm wondering if you can just talk a little bit about the process and the technology and how it relates Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, I, mean, I think at the heart of it is I try never to forget that I'm also making paintings. Paintings are really what I'm, you know, constructing here. And so how a painting becomes itself, um, it's a it's a personal process. You know, my process isn't going to be Greg's, you know, or yours. You're also paint. Um, and um, so 
uh, it's a it's an amalgamation of this desire to build in this sort of deeper level of thought with this very physical and visceral experience of manipulating material, color and paint, and, you know, soupiness and thickness and drippiness and uh, resistance and you know the the just sort of the the way paint feels when you paint. Uh, that's definitely something that I engage with in the process of making paintings very actively, just like any completely non-objective abstract painter would would talk about. You know, it's an arena and you're 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 you know manipulating the material and all that stuff. This kind of painting is exactly the same thing. It's about that every bit as much as it is about any kind of image that evolves and that you know sort of shows up in the in the process. I definitely am looking for it an image to kind of be retained or to to reveal itself in that process. I, I will say that you know I'm using Google Earth, I'm traveling there, I'm um, taking still um, you know screenshots as I'm as I'm using Google Earth and moving around and from those screenshots I'm downloading certain things and then those are like the the like the prompt for getting started on making something but the paintings never look like those screenshots <laughs> the paintings never end up looking like that place they end up looking like paintings that have been squeezed through the lens of me you know through my liver <laughs> you know it's like they're they they have had to be processed those images have had to be processed through the way i sort of put it out there onto the surface so it's not about a simulacrum of the thing that i'm looking at it's about what comes out of this experience and this experience is in the studio on a particular day and and coupled with the experience of 40 years of schlepping an easel on your back and going out into the you know into the actual world so looking at coloration so that it makes me feel connected to real places like the real experience of being outdoors but it also makes me feel connected to the internal which is no less real but the internal places you know the things that are based on emotion, based on um, empathy, based on, well, you know, it's personal. It's, um, I don't know how else to, you know, how, how to better describe that. Well, I've always, you know, I've worked at the gallery 15 years now and I've often, in that time I've gotten to describe your work many times and I've often talked about how your work isn't so much a depiction of a place as an evocation of the emotions of being in a place. And I think that, you know, that is um, very true of this body of work as is as many of many of your paintings. Um, you mentioned, one of the things you mentioned was uh, you talked about color and the importance of color in your work. And one of the things that's really, um, it's one of the things your people, that I often hear comments about the coloration in your work. And so I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about like what influences you know, your color adaptations and your palette choices? Well, um, I mean, in the moment, I don't really think about it very much uh, in terms of like, what do I want to get? Um, like, I don't try and predict what's going to happen when I do a thing. But I do notice that over time, I, I do notice that I seem to be drawn to color which is saturated which has intensity that maybe goes beyond what might be necessary to be descriptive, like physically, perceptually descriptive, and is kind of amped up so that there's an electricity that comes across. You know, there's a, there's a kind of a juice underneath. And it, that's not, a, you know, like I'm not, thinking, I'm going to do this so that that happens, you know, kind of thing. It does feel like it's a completely internal, what a response needs, um, impulse, intuition. Sometimes the, that coloration is really electric, you know, like using hot cadmium red light kind of stuff. And sometimes that impulse is much less electric 
but no less in, uh, impactful. For instance, I don't know if you go to, um, I'm not sure which which one it is that uh, I was telling you about the other day, uh, Daniel. You know, yes, yeah, to the right a little bit. It's the yeah, one with the two trees at the end uh, of that one. Like now more silence. You know, it's, um, yeah, that one right there on the very end. So um, that one has a whole different quality to it as a result of the decision to imbue that with a kind of a, a, a somberness using a, an underpainting that's, um, it's like a lavender gray, um, you know, toned down version of violet that, you know, doesn't really come across. I mean, thank you for zooming in on that, but you can't, it, it just, what it does is it impacts the feeling and the mood, you know, the, and, and for me, um, I find that working from the back to the front is a strategy that works for me. So I, I generally start these paintings working monochromatically or two or three sort of fully saturated colors as a way to find structure and um, sort of find what it is I'm going to kind of hang all this paint on, the, the hangers I'm going to put all this paint on. And then so in this painting, for instance, that monochromatic um, sort of beginning underpainting is in this kind of dull grayed violet and looking at it almost like value uh, instead of color, you know, so it's based on, on dark and light rather than chroma. But the chroma does impact and, the, and um, color does seem to be something that's important to me, you know, <laughs> over the time, it seems to be a thing that shows up as a, as a major component in the paintings that I make, you know. Um, yeah. Well, you've talked a little bit about how the underpainting of this particular work creates a certain kind of mood in it is yeah. there, um, there are others that maybe have a more of a red or a pink or an orange underpainting um, within the show. Can you, maybe we can compare, oh, yeah. just since we're talking about that, maybe we can look at one. I think sure. there's there's another one. Um, I well, don't know, if maybe, you go, if, if I go to follow <laughs> our fates where they lead, that's gonna be on the, that's gonna be on the- That's on the small wall. The first but... corner. Yeah, that, that one right there. Yeah, if you go to that one, and I don't know how close you can get to it, but that's a, a like a bichromate underpainting, uh, starting with kind of a, a pinkish. I used I used this. Uh, I love this pink. I just buy the paint that I buy. You know, the paint that I get. I I, I'm, I buy it partly because I just love the paint itself. I'm not going to name brands here, but um, but like I don't know if can you see my cursor on that screen? I'm zip, zooming. No, in we there. cannot. No. Okay. So if you look at the part that's land, you'll see that the under painting feels kind of pinkish, warm, mm -hmm. hot, hot. And if you look at the part that's sky, you'll see that the underpainting is this intense cadmium yellow. Um, it, it gets almost completely obliterated in the process of painting. But maybe on the left, upper left hand side, maybe Gwen can go in and, or at the upper edge of the painting, you can start to see some of that striking through. So that the painting itself has this intensity underneath in the making, the structure, the laying out the, you know, what it is that's going to be focused on. And it's a really basic structure. It's like, here's the bottom and here's the top, <laughs> you know, kind of thing. Uh, in this painting, it was anyway. And, uh, and then it means that the color, the the secondary and tertiary layers of color that are going to be dropped on there and, you know, multiple layers of color are going to gradually occlude that, but it's never going to be completely locked out of impact. You know, it's going to have, it's going to sparkle through unless you completely kill it, which you can do, you know, I try to pay attention to when that's happening, you know, but uh, unless, unless you completely kill it, it's going to, that sort of energy is going to insist on having something to say. And I find that that's partly why the paintings resonate the way they resonate, you know, um, that they, they kind of feel energized. Um, and yeah. Well, you know, it's interesting when we go out in the natural world, you know, you can ask different people, well, what is that? What color is that? And often you'll get different answers. I mean, I think the reality is that way we perceive color 
varies and it varies from the light and it varies from moment to moment. It varies from person to person and viewer to viewer. And I think, you know, the way you layer color in your paintings really does kind of convey some of that. Um, do you have anything else you want to say before we kind of move on? And I also just want to, um, sometimes people join a little bit later. And so I just want to remind people that if you have questions for Stephen or Greg, please go ahead and put them in the comments and we will try to address them. I see a lot of praise uh, right now from various people in the comments. I'm not seeing a lot of questions yet, but there's praise and, and, and congratulations. And so um, thank you for all for joining. But um, and, uh, Stephen, do you have any one, you know, one last thought you want to say before we kind of move on to Greg? We can come back to questions again towards uh, a little bit later. But um, anything else you want to say they leave us with as we think about? Well, no, but I'll just I'll just tell you something that might be interesting to the painters out there, um, anybody you know who, people who actually are doing this work. Um, a a little sideline thing that I've been doing is is actually um, projecting on the wall the images that I'm downloading off of Google Earth, and then setting up my easel just like I'm outdoors, plein air painting, and approaching the paintings just as if I were outdoors in the face of the land. So it's a really weird thing. You know, it's like, there's no, there's no wind, there's no rain, there's no uh, nature to deal with. There's no, any of that stuff, which is sad, but it's kind of cool too, because what's happening is uh, it's a, it's an engagement in the moment of kind of isolation, meaning COVID, meaning, you know, all that stuff. Um, it's an engagement with the fact that Technologies are not are can be our friends. They're not, you know, it's not a thing that we have to be afraid of, uh, even though you know it might be seem weird to make paintings that are based on the land from streaming or you know uh, translating it through technology that way. But it's engaging me intellectually, and I'm liking that. So it's a, it's that's not what these paintings are, but it's another thing that's going on in there. Well, it's a little bit like attending an artist talk over the internet. <laughs> We're all having to figure out new technologies right now. Yeah, what you get and you don't throw a fit, my old friend Martha used to say. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, thank you, Stephen, and we'll come back to you in a few minutes. And I want to, Greg, thank you for your patience and um, I welcome you. Um, welcome you now. Um, Greg's exhibition, Apprehension of Beauty, is also on view from October seventh through October thirtieth uh, of twenty twenty one. And the show is titled Apprehension of Beauty. Uh, and the gallery has worked with, you know, we've worked with both of these artists a long time. Um, Greg, we've worked with you for 33 years. It's kind of amazing. Um, uh, wow. it's, it's awesome. And in that time, I know there was a short period where we didn't work, uh, where you didn't show as frequently, but, you know, we, you've, um, we've done nine solo shows and you've been in eight of our group shows, which is just wonderful to think about in our 40th anniversary. Um, and uh, you have work in a maze. I, I, it's so lovely to see these paintings. I feel like um, in both cases, both of these artists, I feel like, uh, uh, and this isn't true for necessarily everyone, but I feel really lucky that a lot of our artists have really utilized some of the time during um, the pandemic to just really be in the studio and make incredible artwork. And I feel like we, you both have given us incredible shows. Um, but um, Greg, I wanted to mention some of your really incredible collections that you're in. The Four Seasons Hotel in San Francisco, Microsoft, uh, Apple Apple Computers, the Jordan Schnitzer Family Foundation here in Portland, uh, the Norton Museum of Art in Palm Beach, Florida, the Oakland Museum, and the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art, both in California. I mean, your work is in many prestigious uh, collections, and we are thrilled to have your work in the gallery again. Thank you for being here with us. You're welcome. So um, your title, Apprehension of Beauty, tell me about your title. It's kind of a, it's a, it's an interesting um, wording and I'd love to hear your, hear what it's about. Okay. Um, but first, I just want to say that while listening to you and Stephen talk, um, I've admired Stephen's work for a while now and uh, I feel a great deal of affinity. I'm not going to name it all, but we're both uh, energized by the landscape, observing it and being in it. Um, but just listening to, I've never really spoken with him at length and the, the ideas and the feelings and conceptions and even some procedural things that he was voicing was, I could totally say that. But anyway, so uh, it's this is a really interesting pairing. Uh, and uh, so thank you for including me in this and for including Stephen in it. Uh, so the title, Apprehension of Beauty, um, that's a title 
I'm not really a title person, but um, I do like to read, so I like words. But uh, in, now I'm in my, you know, my latter days. I, I can, there's a, there are occasions where these things meld. So um, I came up with the title, but I didn't have anything to put it to, as an apprehension of beauty. So because I, um, I could go out of direction. I'm very, well, I'll, go, I'll back up. It was in my head, bouncing around. And then, uh, you know, the invitation to show in this uh, two-person exhibition came up, and I thought, "Wow, if there's ever a time to use a title like Apprehension of Beauty, it's right now during the plague years, and that the Earth is on fire." And uh, I don't want—I'm not Debbie Downer. I'm just everybody knows this, so it all goes right into the Apprehension of Beauty because the thing that really uh, caught my intrigued me about that phrase was uh, the seeming paradoxical nature of apprehension and beauty. But it, as any, all of us literate people know that um, apprehension, it means to perceive or to understand, but also means to sense a foreboding. And, uh, you know, beauty is this, you know, is okay, beauty. But um, beauty is, and I think Stephen was touching on this, beauty is something that now we need to take even more seriously because the kind of beauty that is really memorable and that compels us is the kind that scares us a little bit or maybe a lot. And then now you find yourself going, wow, look at that sunset. Oh, yeah, it's the, it's the, fire, it's the whatever the many fires uh, that have been around. That's what's causing the sunset. So there's this little sizzle inside of you because there's a paradox. Uh, I wouldn't say it's guilt exactly, but uh, for me, some of those feelings are unprecedented, and yet that's what's going on for, for all of us, whether we're artists or interested in, in art. So um, I wrote down a couple notes here, and I just, I, it's going to echo what I said, but the turbulence and, and agitation that has this nervous situation between the connotations and denotations of beauty and of apprehension. Um, you know, we all think we know what those words mean, but uh, it's just more and more and more uh, vivid. And, you know, it's, it's tension and anxiety and uh, associated with this history that we're living through. And it's even more unsettling because we don't know what the end's going to be. I mean, there's a lot, depending on what you read. But so as an artist, you're right in the middle of it. Um, a really good friend of mine who's not an artist, but... Uh, we have a rapport and he travels a lot. So he came back to uh, Venetia and called me on the phone and he asked what I was doing. And I said, I had just delivered some paintings to Elizabeth Leach Gallery. And uh, they're really, in my opinion, they're, uh, let's just say they're next level compared to my other body of work. Time will tell if other people agree with me. So he goes, so what was your inspiration? And, you know, stop me cold. I mean, how many times have I been asked that question? And I, and I thought for maybe five beats, and I said, I have nothing to lose. That's the feeling. You go into the studio and um, pick the colors, and uh, whew, away we go. So uh, apprehension means understanding something. And uh, we understand that we're anxious and we're living in a turbulent, foreboding space at this time. And... Uh, if we're not, we're suffering from spiritual amnesia or we're dead. So there we go. And I'm, All I'm right. just, I'll close my comment with one. This will sort of smooth things over. So there's a wonderful book called On Beauty, which many of you have probably heard of by Elaine Scarry. And so the quote that I always love is, and it seems so simple, but it also expresses in a much better way the profundity of the beauty side of this equation. And she says, beauty prompts a copy of itself. That's all I got for that one. Well, you mentioned one of the things you mentioned was um, in, in in your answer to the last question was uh, talking about sunsets and you're talking about nature and you were talking about color and that that kind of leads really well into my next question, which was, can you talk share a little bit about your color inspiration and your considerations of light? And I know that involves the natural world, so there's that similarity to uh, Stephen's work. But I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about your process and where you you know, how you get inspired to make these works. 
Love to. And thank you, Stephen, for setting me up. <laughs> it's, it's setting me up in a good way, not setting me up for a, for a fall. I'm, I'm, and I'm sitting anyway, so I have nothing to fear. Oh, I already said I have nothing to fear. So first of all, um, uh, which is this is not in my notes, but the, my, my actual process outside of the studio, is, which is just as important as what I do in the studio, is that uh, I, I make a drawing in graphite every day in a moleskin notebook. Uh, observing the condition of light by this body of water I live uh, maybe about 100 paces from. It's called the Carquina Strait. So that's the confluence of the Sacramento River and the San Francisco Bay. And just uh, usually looking southwest. So I just, I draw a horizon. You know, I draw what's in the sky. And, you know, maybe the reflections in the water. But they're like notations. And it's not, it's not an object of art. It's an exercise that I do before I get, go to the studio. So uh, my notes. So everything happens in light, as Stephen well knows. You know, light is the matrix of our daily existence. So it's a physical, measurable thing. It's an empirical reality. The light's also a metaphor uh, used in traveling to other regions of consciousness that some people call with a smirk spiritual uh, or not a smirk. You know, so and light and dark are one thing. And but more more importantly to myself is if there's no light, there's no color. You know, color is quickened by light. So uh, because of the way I live and I'm outdoors a lot, you know, I'm actually moving through the light and therefore experiencing color in a way that um, it's like my body is a semi permeable membrane or like Steve is more graphic, you know, the liver. So I'm sure I have color in my liver too, and I, I'm sure it's pretty healthy. But uh, you know, I just can't help but find a way. I wanted to find a way to present color and make the ground, the opaque ground, disappear, and so I can just build these things that summon light and quicken my color. So one of the things that's um, you know that's a little bit hard to tell from seeing these works online, but are very evident when you see them in person, which I invite everyone to do. Um, um, we are open and encourage people to come in um, and see these works in person. But um, these works are a powder, you make them with a powdered pigment and polymer, a, cre a, a paint that, you know, may, for lack of a better uh, term, a paint that, you know, you self create and then apply to a cast acrylic panel that's very similar to plexiglass. So the paintings themselves are, you know, sat, built up. 30, 50 layers of transparent color building up to opacity on a transparent surface. Um, one of the things um, I wanted to ask you about that is through that process, which is a fairly unique process, you know, are there moments of surprise when you're creating the works? Like talk a little bit about the process and, you know, moments yeah. of, of, um, of surprise maybe. Okay. Yeah. Love to. Uh, so uh, in the first, uh, again, there's this, uh, there's this paradox because I, I build the substrates and I, and I build them for, uh, to, to provide order and, and obviously structure and a place for the color to be presented in a way that's more or less unimpeded by uh, opacity. So and I, I build them precisely. And then after that, uh, I invented a process that um, it basically disables my ability to control the paint. And during this, the, 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 the season of painting, I'll call it for this body of work, it was very, very, very hot uh, in my studio. So uh, especially in the afternoon from about two to about seven o'clock, if it's going to be a 90 degree day, it's probably going to be 110 in there. So the more viscous the paint, the faster it dries. And I, for my paint to, to, to let it fly and be out of control, it needs to be very, very loose. So my usual viscosity is maybe like skim milk. But because it was so hot and I had a show to do, I made the paint thinner, which meant I had, I had to do more layers. But the, the color became more nuanced because to get that red that you see right there, um, you can't just mix up a deep red. 
you have to, it'll look, uh, I won't use any curse words, but it'll look really bad. But so it takes many, many layers to get that red. And, uh, and I found it was actually, the richness is amazing. I mean, going back to when I first identified as a painter, I just knew that painting is layered. You paint from the back to the front. You, you cover light, you reveal light, you know, all those things. Um, and, uh, but like this, because of the weather in this case, and because of thinking about the things that we all think about, if we watch too much news, um, it was WTF and here we go. Well, they, whatever you did, they turned <laughs> beautiful. Um, so, uh, one so surprise. Of <laughs> one of um, one of my uh, I'm going to read a quote here, um, but in a review from uh, you know early in your career that was uh, published in Art Forum in 1979, um, Hal Fisher uh, made the you know, wrote this, and I want to read it to you and see what your thoughts are on it now. Um, his work reflects on an intelligent exploration that takes into account both personal methodology and the spectator's visceral response. And that's the end of the quote, but you just used the word visceral. Um, I, I um, you know, in reading that now, it seems as though it could have been written today about this new series. And so despite the um, fact that the aesthetics of your work in 1979 are rather, rather different than your work now, I'm wondering what parts of Hal Fisher's observations, you know, ring true. Okay. So, um... I love that question because I totally great research, uh, Tiffany. I'm getting a little plug to Tiffany. Yes, but Tiffany gave me that question. <laughs> Thank I, you, Tiffany. I, it means that she really was, she wasn't phoning this in, you know, get the gathering of the discovery of data. So, uh, and I, I had forgotten about this. So it was really nice to, to see that and the dates and on it and everything. But uh, the, the funny thing about that review, I remember the work exactly, but I know in the 70s, into the early 80s, even though I identified as a painter and made things out of paint, the way that they ended up, they were actually things. Because what I had around me at that time was in the south of market in San Francisco. So uh, there was a lot of demolition. So I was just looking at the bare walls and then the, the light and color of the sky behind them. And so I did, I did these castings on the floor of my studio and I pour, poured out the polymer and then pulled it up. And when I pulled it up the floor, the Studio, the wood floor came up with uh, polymer. So, and then, but I hung them on the wall like paintings, and I was making things. Uh, so they weren't re weren't even really paintings. But now I'm I, I am making paintings. Uh, there's no doubt about it. So, to come back to the present, um, I'll just read this. I aim in, and this is the first the whole mythology part, to galvanize a somatic or visceral response within the viewer. So those, I just took to pull those two uh, words out from, uh, from the quotation. And so this, these responses are seasoned with a sprinkling of vivid, vivid cognitive flashes. So that's today. And uh, you know, as always, the Irish in me is a little, this painting behind me with the green bottom, I don't even know how to point to that one. Just see that one right there? Mm -hmm. So that's called an Irish goodbye. So, but don't ask me what that means. Uh, and uh, I think, I think that's about it. Let me, let me right. turn the page. Turn it away. Well, 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 don't go yet. Oh, yeah. The, 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 the comment I wrote about my paintings from the 70s and 80s were they were more visceral than intelligent, which is actually true. But uh, they brought me to this place, so I guess there was something right about them. Well, where, wherever, you, where, wherever you started, where you've landed is quite stunning. And Thank you. Um, I really thank you so much for this incredible body of work. Uh, and both of you, Stephen and Greg, it's such a pleasure um, to be living with these paintings in the gallery. And on that note, I want to um, thank you both for being here. And I want to encourage, if the, I don't see any questions, there's a lot of, um, I don't know if either of you have looked at the comments, um, but there's a lot of congratulations. and comments and people just saying hi and things like that, but I'm not seeing many questions yet. So I'm um, gonna give people just a few more minutes uh, to um, uh, to ask questions if they have them and talk a little bit about uh, the shows just in sort of in general. Um, but um, 
Both shows are on view October 7th through 30th of this year, 2021. And you can visit the gallery 24-7 online, or you can visit the gallery in person, which I encourage you to do to see both of these shows in person. They, they look beautiful online, but they are really quite um, powerful in person. And we are open Tuesday through Saturday, 1030 to 530. Um, and by appointment. So if for some reason, one of those, those to that time window doesn't work for you, contact the gallery and we can um, set up a time to show you the work outside of those hours. Um, no appointment is needed to come by during those regular hours, Tuesday through Saturday, 1030 to 530. Just stop by. Um, we are in compliance with um, state mandate. We are requiring face masks. Um, but uh, anyone can come in and take a look at these paintings and spend time with these um, really quite stunning paintings. Uh, do either of you have anything else you would like to say before we uh, say good night? Well, I'm just, uh, it's an honor to have uh, the opportunity to share the work uh, with everybody. I, always, it's always an honor to have that opportunity. Nobody expects it, doesn't have to happen. So when it does, thank you. Well, thank you for sharing them with us. Greg, what were you gonna say? Strangely enough, really, not. I have nothing to say other than I'm uh, really happy to be here in this moment and to show with Stephen. Well, I, I, um, it's exciting, uh, Greg. To you're here and in person, and it's so great to see you. And I hope the two of you. I know you both have. You've both commented how some of the comments and and questions and conversation has um, related to each, each other. So I hope you have a time. Uh, to safely uh, safely connect in person uh, during your visit, if that works out. Uh, if not, next time. But um, it's such a pleasure to have both of your work in the gallery, and um, I really encourage everyone who is tuning in uh, here live or who watches this later, uh, please come by and see these works in person. You you will um, you will thank yourself for <laughs> for coming down to see them. So um, on behalf of Elizabeth and um, the gallery team and myself, I want to thank you both for these incredible shows. And I want to thank everyone who's joined us tonight uh, for, being, for being here and um, taking part in our 40th anniversary program. Uh, again, these shows are on view October 7th through 30th. And they are you can come see them in person Tuesday through Saturday, 1030 to 530 at Elizabeth Leach Gallery. Um, also, just if for some reason you're checking in, so I, I think there's a few of Stephen Hayes' family members who, who've popped on. If you can't come here and see the show in person um, because you're not here in Portland, we do have really great online viewing rooms um, for both of these exhibitions. So visit our website and go to the viewing room section and you can see really great in-depth um, kind of visual tours of the exhibitions. Uh, so if for some reason you can't come in person, that's a way to uh, dive a little deeper uh, into these exhibitions besides just the images you're seeing now. So um, looks like there's a couple more people. Someone said thanks, uh, Gwendolyn, who's doing the video camera so that people we can see the images. So thanks, Gwen. And um, uh, there's just more really great praise and comments um, on the comment section. So I hope both of you artists will look at that before we log off because um, those will kind of disappear, uh, unfortunately, once we once we log off. But thank you, everyone, for joining us tonight. And Stephen, thank you for being here. Greg, thank yeah. you for being here. And uh, thank you for these great shows. And I, um, it's a pleasure to have them here at the gallery. Thank you, Daniel. And uh, Greg, maybe we can get together while you're still in town. We'll maybe talk tomorrow. Um, that would be great. We have a few okay. things in common. We do. <laughs> we do. All right. Well, thanks, everyone, and uh, good night. Okay. Good night. Good night. Sleep tight.